everybody it is november 1st hope you guys are doing good it is so good to be back and be able to do an audio for you guys and i am so far behind it's unbelievable um so just real quick you guys i think it was february 18th friday the 18th or 19th something like that i was supposed to put on the audio and i delayed it because i was waiting for information end up being absolutely nothing it's not even worth mentioning what i was waiting for and then um, I think it was the 21st, something like that, October 21st, Monday, and to put out another audio. And I had left the Saturday before and just simply got swamped. You guys, it was the, you know, it was supposed to be a working vacation. It was supposed to be, you know, just absolute fun and end up not being that. Actually, I shouldn't say that. It was fun, but it, it was it was a hard work block. So let me give you guys... This is what I want you guys to do, all right? Fair warning. I got a great report for you guys. I'm going to be very, very thorough, all right? So, but for the people who don't like geopolitics and because these questions that I have, that's what it's directed towards. People want to know the mechanics of how this stuff works, how it has an effect on the Iraqi dinar. You can click stop now because I'm done hearing from you people. Any complaints about that stuff, you go straight in the spam box. I erase you from it all. Don't need you anymore. All right. And I don't, you know, you guys, people are, people aren't being jerks. They're actually kind of nice, but, um, I'm just done with it. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't need people's shit like that anymore. So I'm going to answer people's questions that they send me these questions. And I'm going to answer them and be thorough. Otherwise it feels like I'm, I'm not giving you guys my best. That's one. Number two, I want you guys to relax today. So hit pause, go get your favorite beverage because I want to be able to make up and, and sit down and have a conversation with you guys as if I'm sitting right across from you because that's what I love to do. Actually, I'm not very good at getting in front of a microphone and I, it just it's, it still feels weird. After doing it all these years, it still feels weird and a lot of people who know me and have met me over the years know, you know that... You know, my, my tempo is a little bit different when I get in front of you and give a live talk and stuff like that. So it's still kind of strange. So I'm going to try to, I just want to have fun with you guys. But I also want you guys to get the best correct information that you can get on the planet. And so just relax. So first things first, because it's very interesting on what I was doing um, this last two weeks. All right, because it has to do with China. It has to do with the tariffs. So here's a little situation. We'll get we'll get into the report, but you you know this will kind of make you a little bit smarter on understanding what's going on and one of the issues. And I work with these companies that are um, you know they're international companies and they do business in China. And because of the tariffs, what happened? 2016, the Chinese know what Trump's up to. I mean you know he said it from day one. He's been saying it. For 20 years, I'm going to put, you know, uh, we need to put tariffs on China. Back in, back in the early days, it was Japan, believe it or not. And then now it's China. But, you know, this is what we need to do, and this is why. So it's no secret. Everybody knows. So he becomes president of the United States, and then China makes sure that people can't convert the yuan, the American business can't convert the yuan into the Hong Kong currency and back into the U.S. dollar. And that's what's going on in Hong Kong. All right, we've talked about this before, but this is a little bit different though. The problem that we were trying to solve this last couple weeks is that now that the tariffs are happening, what's going on with the American companies is that the United States government will take the money out, no warning or nothing. So the you know business, let's say, and I'll give you the exact numbers what we're dealing with. One of the companies, rubber seals, you guys, just little round rubber seals coming out of China and being shipped to Tennessee, all right? You know, 1.4 million a month. And so the government pulls out its, the percentage of its tariff out each and every month. No warning, no nothing, just boom, it's gone. <laughs> so, and what these companies were trying to do is like, hey, look, 
instead of taking out the money from these tariffs each month, can we sit on that money somehow, reinvest it, earn our, our you know, more off it by the end of the year, pay you exactly the percentage that you deserve, but let us make more money off it. And the counter from the government was, can you guarantee that the companies that you invest in or entities that you invest in aren't backdoor companies that are sponsored by China and somehow that money gets cycled back to China? And the answer was no. And so the government said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> and so that, you know, it's that interesting. And that's what happened. Very, very strange though. So that's some of the dilemmas. The other thing I wanted to throw this out there, a lot of people don't know because they think it's across the board problem for every company. Remember, there's companies out there that have three, 400% profit margins. Out of, with the companies that we were working with the last two weeks, there was only one company that had a problem and it was the way that they positioned that company, the way when that company was built, the profit margins were less. And so the tariffs mean something, it's hurting them. They're not gonna go out of business, but it's hurting them. But there's other companies making three, 400%. So they don't care, the tariffs aren't going to hurt them. They'll, they'll do what they wanna do. So that's kinda how if you wanna do business internationally, how do you get out of the tariff wars? Well, you invest in products that have such a huge profit margin that the tariff wars don't hurt one way or the other. And so um, just, something that, just something to think about because that's the reality. A lot of people think that every company in China wants to leave. That's not true. That's not true. It's only the companies that are within the profit margins that are within our, our, um, what they're not gaining anymore based on the tariffs. So either the profit margins are smaller and or their profit margins are, are eaten up because of the global competition. And that'll change. So let's say, let's say if a company is making 600% profit, well, as markets open up in Southeast Asia and in Africa and in other countries, then those profit margins are gonna keep going down. Why? Because those countries are gonna have cheaper labor than China, especially Africa. And so that'll eventually change. So very interesting stuff though, isn't it? And it all has to do with what we're talking about with the rock. But anyways, that's what we were dealing with. And, um, and so it was just, a, it was a huge learning curve. It was very, very cool. So I thought I'd share, share that with you guys. So let me jump into this, all right? The very first, actually somebody sent me this article. And some of these questions are going to seem repetitive, but just bear with me. And so people in general are asking, hey, look, you know, What's going on with Trump and Turkey and Russia and the Kurds and Syria? How do we make sense of it? Can we dissect that? Does it have an effect on Iraq? Does it have an effect on the timing of the revaluation? Does it have an effect on the value of the revaluation and the timing of the revaluation? In other words, it seems like I'm repeating that, but let's say if it comes out at 10 cents, is it gonna take two, three years for it to get to $1.17 or whatever. So let's try to answer all that. And it's a very easy answer, but I wanna give you the thorough on how the mechanics work on, on exactly what's going on. Uh, there's some basic principles that I wanna be able to throw out in front of you guys so you'll know. You know, again, you guys, I'm going to kind of flip the page here from the old audios that I gave and stuff like that and start trying to give you guys the authority. In other words, you won't need to ask anybody. You'll know. And so there's a couple more principles I wanted to be able to teach you and throw this stuff out there, all right? So here it is, and this is from an article. And this is a response from Trump and, and people asking him, you know, what's going on with Turkey? What are you doing? How are we doing it? So Turkey can't want a war with the Kurds. But if it does, we can't be killing Turks with Americans uh, throughout Turkey. Our base is there. So in other words, Turkey is part of NATO and Turkey is part of containment. Containing who? Containing Russia. They're containing Russia. Some will cast any deal with Turkey as at real Donald Trump getting close with a dictator. It's not. It's dealing with the realities that we can't stay forever. So we've aligned, uh, we aligned under Obama with the Kurds but the PKK 
the sworn enemy of the Turkish Republic, our ally, and they are our ally. All right? We were sowing the seeds of a Turkish PKK war with that policy. We were also driving Turkey towards Russia. So you guys, since 1944, our whole policy, look where our base is at, go get a map. We're containing Russia, we're containing China. And that's it. And so why is Trump giving a little bit of uh, room, wiggle room for Turkey? Because Turkey was the relationship, I mean, think about this at the beginning of the Trump administration. What happened? Turkey with an F, an American F-16 shot down a Russian jet. And then the pilot was killed on the ground. All right. That's not good for the relationship between Turkey and Russia. And we're, we're, you know, we're not hoping for that, but that's what was going on. Next thing you know, Russia put tariffs on anything coming up from Turkey to Russia, all the clothes. If you want to know where all the clothes is made for the Russians, it's in Turkey. All that cheap labor and all that mercantile and all that stuff that comes from Turkey. So their, their relationship was souring. So what, what did Putin do? He's like, I need to reverse this. Because in 1997, the Russians said, they put out their geopolitical strategy, we're going to get out of containment. And the key to getting out of that containment is Iran. And we'll expand through the Middle East through Iran. In other words, what's the next step? Syria. What's the next step? Iran. Or I'm sorry, Iraq. And then all, all the way down. And so what did we do? We responded. We stopped that. Very simple. That's it. That's all it is. Nothing more. The rest is bullshit, guys. Christianity versus Islam, bullshit. The, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you want to throw up there. It was making sure Russia doesn't get out of their containment. Same thing with Vietnam. Same thing with South Korea. Same thing with, you know, or the, the Korean War. It's all containment. That's it. Any conspiracies, anything out there is all garbage. It's when these guys, that the top leaders of the world, when they, what are they talking about? They're talking about expanding the markets. So what does Russia want to do? Russia wants to expand its markets. What do they need? They've needed this since the 1800s. When Peter the Great died, he said, we need a warm water port. Now they have a port in Syria now, and they have a port in you know the Caspian Sea, but... Think about this guy, or guys. That's not the ocean. You can continue. I mean, all you have to there's go look at the gateways to the Mediterranean. There's two. Can you name them? Boom! You can block the Russian navy inside that. All right. Russia has a couple of ports um, above Japan. Go find it, and go look at what condition it is for six months out of the year. It's frozen, <laughs> so they don't have a warm water port. And why would they want a warm water port to expand their markets? And that's it. Nothing more than that. So what Putin said to Turkey is like, look, before we get into a war, why don't, you know, we, Turkey has the same problem as everybody else. What's Turkey want to do? Expand their markets. So let's see if we can both expand our markets and see what we can do. We want to get out of containment. We want to expand our markets. This is Putin. Turkey says, fine. And they started working it out. And guess what? It was working. And so the Russians are, are taking out of our lap Turkey, which is part of our containment. You guys want proof? Go look at where the military bases are in Turkey. It's very simple. And we couldn't have that. So we had to go and counter that. We had to tell Turkey, it's like, look, you know, we know you what you're up to. We know that the Russians want to expand their markets and you want to expand their, but what Trump and his administration said was the exact same thing Nixon and Kissinger said to China. So you guys want to expand your markets, huh? Yeah. All right, well, do you want to expand your markets with the Russians where it's 1.5 cent or, you know, um, per the Russian ruble compared to the US dollar, what are they producing? Or do you want to expand your markets with the West? Well, who do you think Turkey picked? <laughs> so it's like, let's pull you guys back. All right. 
And um, what else are you guys worried about? Worry about the Kurds. You know, there's this minority group in the Middle East and they're a threat to our country and our geopolitical strategy of us expanding our markets. In other words, if we have to fight these guys, we can't expand our markets because of the cost. And so Trump took advantage of that. So the Kurds are not part of our containment. All right? Turkey is. Turkey's part of our containment. Turkey helps us keep Russia in check. So you have, you know, and, and so that's all it is. And here's the thing, you guys. There's no guarantee it's going to work. There's no guarantee it's going to work. But what we did is we gave Turkey wiggle room. They're not pulling out of containment. They're not pulling out of NATO. And what's funny is, is the article's coming out because you have Russia, they're on patrols with Turkey. That's not because they're partners, ladies and gentlemen. That's because Russia doesn't trust Turkey. And they don't want Turkey to go below the 20 miles. So Turkey is 20 miles into Syria. What's, why would Russia be worried that Turkey would go beyond that? So at the very beginning, we talked about that in 1997, that Russia said that the key to get out of containment is Iran. And what's the first step out of Iran? It's Syria. All right, so if Turkey advances, Turkey's part of NATO, Turkey advances and takes over Syria, they just pushed back Russia's offensive to get out of containment. So you guys get it? You might have to listen to this a couple times and write it down, but you'll see it. You just put the name of the country, the arrow, and then, you know, but Turkey taking over Syria. Remember, Turkey is part of our containment policy to keep Russia from having a warm water port. So if Turkey was to take over Syria, it would take away that foothold that that Russia got through Iran into Syria. And they're trying to push down even further. You guys, it's nothing more than that. Nothing more than that. And that's all it is. No guarantee it's going to work. You know, because here's what the United States, here's how you measure it from the, uh, the, American, the American perspective. And then we'll get into measuring it for, from Iraq's perspective. So the way that Trump has set this up, look at, look at the last administration, all right? Look at the deals that they did with Iran. Did Iran advance their agenda? Absolutely. Did they expand their markets? Absolutely they did. They had troops in Syria, all right? And who was backing Iran? Russia. So obviously, they were starting to move out of containment. And so Trump pushed all that back. And the oil fields that were being taken over by ISIS now are in control of American hands. So the reason I'm telling you that, it's not the, it's not the go after one president or another, that look what Trump gave up. What did he give up? He gave up nothing. Is Russia getting out of containment? No. Does Russia or Syria or Iran or the Caliph or anybody have control of those oil fields in Syria that we took over? No, we give up nothing. We give up nothing. So what's Trump trying to do? He's trying to avoid a huge war. Because he's like, look, hey, look, there, there's a couple things going on here. Nobody wants to stop the, the containment policy of the United States, all right? We don't, there's nobody on the left or the right who wants Russia to get out of containment. It's just not, you know, everybody's afraid of Russia. But what Trump is saying is like, look, you got it, you got your economy is smaller than South Korea's. The Russian ruble, the one ruble equals 1.5 cents, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> 1.5 cents. What do we need to go to war from? I mean, they're not getting out of containment. The Russian ruble's gone. The price of oil is going down. And what are we going to do? Sacrifice a million military men for what? That's all he's looking at. So what he's saying, can we get away with keeping China and Russia in containment but not using our troops? Can we do that? And you guys, it might not work. It might not work, but that's all it is. That's what's going on. That's what you're, That's the drama that you're seeing between Turkey and all that stuff. So let's see how it works. If it doesn't work, the United States has no problems 
of going right back up there and kicking everybody's ass again. All right? So the United States, now here's the thing, because a lot of people get confused. It's like, well, look, Russia, Russia, Russia reported, I think Putin reported they did like 70,000 bombings within a month. It's like, what's going on here? We're both fighting ISIS. And how do you define that? How does that, that you know, that not get on, um, you know, how do you, you, you fix that? There's over oil fields. Russia wanted to control those oil fields. They lost. We took control of those oil fields. So we're both fighting the same enemy over the same oil fields. Wasn't that we're in cahoots together? Wasn't that we have the same ideology or we have the same morality or anything like that? We're both fighting over the same oil fields, so we're both fighting the same enemy. We happen to have a common enemy, but we weren't fighting them as a joint force to defeat a common enemy. We beat Russia. So Russia bombed the shit out of them, did 70 bombings per month, and we went in there and took them out within like eight months. And now we have control of those oil fields. And so, you know, if you look at what the Russians did from the military perspective, you know, they tried to do to us, the United States, in Syria, what they did in um, the Crimea. And what did they do? They showed up with no patches on their uniforms. Nobody knew who these guys were or whatever. And they took over the Crimea. Nobody could say anything because nobody knew who it was. So that's their little trick. Well, they tried that on a a uh, oil field, one of the oil fields in Syria. So this is how it went down. <laughs> you know, so the Russians show up, and we're watching this, right? We're watching this from from three levels of technology: from satellites, from drones, and from um, C-130 gunships, or I should say, um, AWACS airplanes. So we're just, we're just sitting there, you know, kicking back. These these guys in the military drinking a coke and sitting there watching these military vehicles approach on these oil fields. And so, you know, the basically, um, you know, somebody called the Russians and say, hey, do you guys have troops approaching? And I forget what sector it was or whatever. And the Russians like, no, they go, okay. And so the United States is like, good, it's not the Russians. Let's go kill everybody. And that's what happened. They kicked the living shit out of the Russians. All right. These weren't conscripts where it's some guy serving in the military for two years. What these guys were is they were ex-military, ex-special forces, maybe not all of them. And now they worked for uh, a private firm, just like we have in the United States, our private armies. They were working for the Russians and they wanted to take over an oil field. They thought they could get away with it. We ended up kicking the living shit out of them. So it'll give you an idea that we weren't in um, some type of joint operation. The reason I'm throwing this out there, because that's actually giving these courses that I give out, especially with this group that I gave um, this last week, they were confused about that. Very, very confused about this. Like how, you know, Russia's bombing the same people. The United States is bombing the same people. How is that possible? Were we joint operations? No, no, we're just fighting over the same oil fields. But we control those oil fields. We control that energy in that country. Right? Is it all of it? No. But we control it. And so we haven't given that up. Pulling our 300 troops that we have hasn't given that up. And think about this from, from a perspective, you guys, from a policy perspective. Because you have people in the military that are, I mean, it's got to be gut-wrenching. It really does because they worked alongside with the Kurds, fought with them in the trenches, and then, you know, basically we had to we had to walk away from it. But do we help the Kurds and then the Kurds get in a shooting war with Turkey and then Turkey is now friends with Russia and now Russia is getting that much closer out of containment? Do we do that or do we give up the Kurds? Now you're in the big boy world, all right? And it's going to be a tough decision no matter what. But I think Trump made the bigger decision 80 million Turks. They have a massive military. And we have our military bases in their country. The Kurds don't have a country. As much as I hate the situation that they're in, that's the reality. So there is no good answers for, for any of this stuff. you know. But again, nothing set in stone here. If Turkey advances, 
the United States is going to destroy Turks, Turkey's economy. And guess what? They're probably going, going to be best friends with Russia because of it. And so we'll destroy both their economies together. Because we are destroying Russia's economy right now. Every second. I mean, think about this. Every second, sitting there drinking your favorite beverage, right? We're producing more oil. More oil is coming out of the ground. More and more and more and more and more. So every second, every drip, every drop of petroleum coming out of the ground is destroying the Russian economy that much more. And it's at, the Russian ruble is at 1.5 cents. All right, so what effect does it have on our rock? It doesn't have any effect on a rock at all. So let's say that a rock has, you know, let me put it this way. The troops coming out of Syria, some of them started going into a rock. And then supposedly, if you look at the propaganda coming out of Russia, it's like the government of Iraq officially wants American troops out of Iraq. Well, that's not true. It was the Shia and their influence of the government that wanted the, uh, the Americans out of Iraq. And it doesn't matter what the Iraqis want. The United States will, you know, it's like, hey, look, we go where we want. <laughs> so, you know, um, we do our concern about your concerns. Um, we have a customer help desk. Uh, but we're going to be here, whether you like it or not. So the protests that you guys are asking about, twofold. One, that the people aren't stupid. They, they know that the oil prices are going down. All right, When the oil prices were up, they were high and mighty, the people didn't get anything. The government's not taking care of the, the people. Now the oil prices are going down. Now they're like, okay, you guys, you didn't take care of us when we did have money. Now you're telling us we're going to go broke. That's why there's protest, all right? People are, people are starting to get pissed. People are starting to get pissed. So that's what's going on. Then you have more protests, which had to do more with the hybrid warfare, where there's protests going on, and that had to do with the back and forth between the American troops going back into Iraq. It was very little, very little, but it was all symbolic. But the United States will go wherever the damn well they please. I mean, then that's it. If we want to go to the islands that the Chinese are creating between Vietnam and the Philippines will do it. And there's not a damn thing the Chinese can do about it. I don't care what they say on the news. I don't care what their military says they have or how big the parade is. If the United States of America wants to take, take those islands that they're creating in the South China Sea, we will do it. And there's not a damn thing they can do about it. And they know it. So... You know, that's kind of a little bit what the last protests that are going on with in Iraq is about. But let me put it this way, all right? You know, let, actually, let me start reading some questions here. That, that'll kind of thoroughly ask it some more. But you guys, that's the situation going on with Turkey. It's containment. It always will be containment. And Trump, if you look at it from his perspective, there's no guarantee for success, but he's like, why sacrifice our troops? Can we keep Russia in containment without sacrificing our troops? Has anybody even asked this damn question before? Can we help Turkey expand its markets, keep them in NATO, in containment, without pissing them off? Or we might have to give up a little bit. Can we do that? At least they're not in the laps of the Russians. And if it doesn't work, we'll destroy them anyways. But, I mean, let's give it a good college try. That's all it is. Nothing more. Nothing more than that. So it's official, ladies and gentlemen. This last week, I was having these migraines, giving my course, the full course, and uh, <laughs> it's like, dude, you're not having migraines. You need to get glasses. Because this guy was sitting there watching me take a piece of paper in front of me and move it back and forth until it focused in. He's like, don't lie to yourself. You need glasses. I put. I went to Walmart and got some just some cheap reading glasses, and guess what? Hallelujah! All of a sudden, the headaches went away. So I guess it's you know, nature taking its course. Um, let me see. Let me read some of this stuff. What is your view on the impact of the current situation in Syria, especially with the drawing of American troops? That's it. Does it have any effect on Iraq? No. 
It doesn't have any effect on the rocks markets. Could it later on down the road? Sure, but right now it does not. Right now we're getting what we want, containment. We control the, the oil fields in Syria. And it's not affecting any deals. You guys have to look. You know, there's other things that are on the table. We're trying to do deals with the Middle East. It's an economic package where they're bringing, we're bringing them into our markets. We're expanding the United States markets. So it's, think about that juggle for a minute. We're trying to shrink OPEC. But at the same time, we're trying to take those exact same countries and bring them into our market. Can we do that? That's a tough juggle. That's all it is. All the garbage, all the talk, all the back and forth about Obama, Trump, George Bush, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. That's all we're trying to do. Shrink their markets, expand our markets. And we don't mind people that look at Japan. We're not aggressive towards Japan. Japan's markets are expanding. South Korea's markets are expanding. Huge, big time. Are we threatening to blow them up? No. So, you know, we're expanding our markets. Um, let me see, Tony, what's causing the daily rise in oil prices? What has changed? I know the prices fluctuate. So what factors are causing the upward fluctuation? And right now, it's specifically just because it's a driving season. All right. It'll go up again when Thanksgiving comes along. That's one. Number two, OPEC has uh, pulled back on their production. And they're just, you guys, they're trying to survive. They're trying to get as much out of every drop of oil that they can. Because you guys know, we've talked about it a million times. The price of oil is going to go down. All right. So, you know, it'll fluctuate a little bit. But it's amazing because the reports that I get, that I look at, that talk about production and the cause and effect it has on the price for, uh, on, on the oil prices internationally, domestically and internationally, the numbers keep getting better and better and better. The, now, the oil prices haven't gone down the, to that, that perfect magic number where we destroy OPEC and Russia. But what these reports are coming out is that it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper for us to pull it out. And the projected numbers for lower oil prices keep getting better and better and better. So here, here was one of the dilemmas. When, once we start pulling oil out and it gets so cheap, well, then companies don't make as much money and they go out of business. All right. Well, the way that technology is working and the way that our market is working and the way that we're trying to put this together correctly is the oil prices can go down and these companies won't go out of business. And that's what we're trying to conquer that has never been conquered before. Will it work? I don't know. I don't, I, I don't have the answer to that. But that's kind of some of the stuff that we're solving. So think about this. We're expanding our markets anyways. We're, we surrounded Iran, or I should say surround Iran. We took the oil fields away from ISIS. That's our market now. Venezuela, we shut them down. Libya, we're pretty much control of their market. And then we take over, you know, their delivery routes, right? You know, who are their customers? And now we sell our oil to them. So not only are we producing, but we're selling oil to all these people's customers. And we would love to do that to Russia. I doubt that will ever happen. It'll probably start World War III. But, um, you know, but if we get the oil prices down, it doesn't mean anything anyways. So we just keep the customers we have. Our economy will skyrocket because you and I could probably drive to New York for 50 bucks. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, from, from California to New York, it'll be that stupid. Um, you know, so here comes the climate change people. You know, they're going to attack our oil prices. And who's that help? OPEC and Russia. What a coincidence. What a coincidence. So that's some of the dilemmas that we're dealing with. But again, what's it have to do with Iraq? You guys, they're going to go broke. They're going to go stupid broke. So they're in the middle of a transition. All right? They're going, everybody knows they're going to go. That's why there's protests going on. There's other reasons too. But the main protest is that, so you're telling us we were a bunch, we were broke like a joke the whole time we were making money. Now you're telling us we're not going to be making any money like we were. And you never even helped us in the first place. Yeah, it's, I mean, the United States, that wouldn't be a protest. That'd be a full-on revolution. 
You know, people are going to get killed. That's what would happen in the United States. <laughs> let me see. So the, uh, by the way, let me let me be very clear. The, you know, the daily price right now is the production from OPEC and Russia. They cut back, and it's a driving season. So very specifically that, and that'll be eaten up by our reserves, our oil reserves, very quickly. So let me vet this out real quick. I don't want to read that because that's from a guru. So Tony, I know you've been in this investment for a long time. Are you surprised that it's taking so long for the reval? Is it an advantage to a rock to hold back as long as possible? Thanks. So here's, look, there was a couple windows. And and remember, you have, you have three administrations, right? You had George Bush Jr. He had, he had a, a, an agenda. Well, Barack Obama had a completely different agenda. And then Trump's agenda just blows everybody's out of the water. It's completely different. And I'm not saying that whether it's good or bad, even though I, I say it's good. But I'm just saying it's that, it's that different. It's a game changer. It's a global game changer. George Bush Jr. was, it was same old shit. Obama was the same old shit on steroids. All right? With Trump, people are getting hurt. People at the top are getting hurt. So that's where you're seeing a lot of um, pushback. But here's the deal. The reason I'm telling you that is because there was a couple of windows. There was a couple of very, very fine, small windows where that Iraq was going to add value to their currency and you know the, they were going to be able to go into the markets, take a chunk of the markets out with the value of their currency and the oil prices would have been high enough to where they maintain their economy. And then whatever they made in the market, so it could have been one or the other, whether they made the oil was, was extra or whatever they made in the markets was extra and they were going to be filthy rich. And that was their plan. And so it just kept, you guys, the value of the price per barrel kept going up. Remember in 2008, what did the price per barrel go up to? $147 per barrel. That's when the United States went into recession. That's when the mortgage and loan crisis was, was exposed. You know, it's just, like a, it's just like a ship being battered all the time. What's the weak point of the ship? Where was it? And it ended up being that. In it being, um, and, and eventually what they don't tell you is that it messed up the United States currency supply. All right. And we've had to correct that. And everything's fine. Now the value of the currency is too high. Everybody's lowering the value of their currencies. So there goes the, what do the people call it in the dinar world? The, um, <laughs> the um, global reset. I mean, it's the most, it's, th th whatever they say is exactly opposite of what's going on. How, I mean, how could you be that retarded? How could it be that bad? Everybody's trying to lower the value of their currency to give them an advantage. And these guys saying there's going to be a, a global reset, get your prosperity packages so you can, and it's, it's like Trump is begging, begging the Federal Reserve to devalue their currency. The U.S. dollar, it's too high. All right, so here's here's the rub. It's not for every country that that's that's the advantage. You know, there has to be a huge labor force for that to work correctly. Iraq doesn't have a huge labor force like that, so they needed to get into the markets, and they needed a, a, a currency to get into the markets. They wanted to have a one-two punch. They lost both. All right, but it wasn't because of timing. Here's the thing: look at what Iraq was doing why the prices were going up. It's very simple. What's a rock doing, ladies and gentlemen? What do they want to do? So this will give you a measuring tool on whether a rock's doing good or bad, whenever. It doesn't matter 100 years ago, 50 years ago. What is every country from the very first civilizations, whether it be the Mesopotamia or the, the Euphrates River, all right, the Tigris and Euphrates River, the Nile, the Indus River in Pakistan, or the, the, the Yangtze River, the Yellow River in China. That's where 
civilizations began. But what have they been trying to do ever since? Expand their markets. Whoever has the markets that's expanding or the biggest markets rules. So what do you think Iraq's trying to do? Are they trying to expand their markets or not? So here's a measuring tool for you. Was Iraq expanding their markets the last, um, from when, since I got into this investment, I think it was like 2008, was Iraq expanding their markets? Absolutely they were expanding their markets. So you can't throw darts at them. Remember all this stuff? It's like, well, it's the dinar is going to revalue Tuesday or Friday, and it didn't would it, it you know wouldn't revalue. Then you had these morons go out there and say, well, Maliki did that. He pulled that back, and they were expanding the markets. Period. End of story. That's the measuring tool. Where they you know they were expanding the markets price wise because of oil, and that's it. So right now, what's happening in Iraq? Their markets are shrinking, aren't they? They're not expanding their markets. And there's nothing they can do in the oil markets to change that. So how do they expand their markets now? They add value to their currency. So whatever dreams that they had, where they had the one-two punch or whatever, that's gone. Everything has changed. The world is a completely different back. I mean, it's completely different. So how does a rock expand their markets? And that's it, you guys. That's how you measure it. So when you ask, so let me go through this question again. I know you've been in this investment for a long time. Are you surprised that it's taking so long for it to re revalue? Is it an advantage to a rock to hold back? Are they expanding the markets? Then it's to their advantage. Is their market shrinking? Then they need to make a different move then, isn't it? The reason I put it in the terms that I did, Jim, it's because I want to give you the authority. It's very simple, all right? From here on out, from here until, until you know, you're, you're off this rock and nobody's getting off this planet unscathed. I don't care who you believe in. United States of America, every president from George Washington up today. So I can go through and we can do a very exact measuring exercise. Was this president expanding the market of the United States or not? Yes, click. Was this president expanding the, the markets of the United States or not? Yes, click. Go all the way down. You don't need to know what their race is. You don't need to know what church they went to. You don't need to know if they were married to ugly women. You don't need to know what college they went to. All the bullshit that CNN, Fox News, and all these other assholes will report. Is the United States markets expanding or not? That's all you flipping need to know. Doesn't matter what your preacher says at Sunday on the pulpit. Doesn't matter what. It, you want to know one thing when you go to the polls. Is our markets being expanded or not? Is this guy doing good for us or not? Then I'll vote for that guy. If they're not expanding their markets, get that shithead out of here. It's that easy. So for a rock, your question is, is it taking too long? Well, for them, if they if they were expanding their markets from 2008, since I've been in a, you know the, this investment, speculating on this, think about when I got into this. I you know we made a ton of money off the ISX, and the oil prices kept going up. So Iraq expanded their markets, and I kept telling people this, and they refused to listen to it. You know why? It didn't fit their narrative. They didn't get rich the next day. <laughs> And that's all it is, ladies and that's the, that's the key to all of it. Is Russia expanding their markets? Is China expanding their markets? Is Iraq expanding their markets? Is Iran expanding their markets? And then you'll be able to tell me who's doing good, who's doing bad. Forget about the shit that you hear out there. It's expanding our markets. How do we, ex what vehicles do we use to expand our markets? Those will be the butt of every conspiracy theory out there. If there's an institution within the United States that's expanding our market, they'll create a conspiracy theory about it. And then when the institution does not, or is not effective anymore, it's not expanding our markets, it'll go away. You guys get it? Life's not a mystery, is it? So was a rock expanding their markets? Absolutely. Were they making the right decisions? Sure. Can you, can you quarterback and say, well, they should have did this. They should have bought the winning lottery ticket. It means nothing. They were expanding their markets. 
Now their markets are not expanding. They're in trouble. Guess what? This is very good for you and me. You get it? That's all it is. So when you, if you look at any president, doesn't matter who it is, they have to look at how do we expand our markets? Are we going to um, destroy somebody else's market? Are we going to go to war over it? You know, how do we balance that? You guys, that's it. You, I mean, that's all it is. <laughs> Ideology, theology is a software that's expanding markets. Everybody's doing the exact same thing. This crap where there's a monster under the table and, and or under their bed and, you know, it does not exist. The Chinese hate us because we expanded our markets on them and they and we're retaliating because they're expanding their markets on us. So let me let me throw a couple examples out there. Is you, you know, China, their main group that runs China. Well, they're the communists, right? The United States capitalists. But what are we both trying to do? Expand our markets. All right, what about Russia? Russia used to be communist. Then they were secular for about oh about five years. Now they're Orthodox Christian, which people don't know. They're officially an Orthodox Christian country. What do they try to do under communism? Expand their markets. What do they try to do under secularism? Expand their markets. What do they try to do under Orthodox Christianity? Expand their markets. You guys get the flipping pattern? So that's it. You don't need to ask me, bro. You should be able to tell me that these guys were expanding their markets. So that's a good deal. And it might not be convenient for you and me as far as us investing in the Rocky Dinar. Um, I know some of you people are desperate out there, but that's reality. Good news, they're not expanding their market. So, hey, <laughs> you know, don't jump out any windows yet. But they can. A rock can expand their markets. You and I are sitting on the tool that they have to expand their markets. should make you very, very happy. And that's the reality. That's all it is. That, you guys, that's it. You just figured out all of politics, geopolitics. You just figured it out. If a light bulb goes off, good, because that's what I've been trying to preach since 1994. It's about market expansion. So Iraq demonstrates, demonstrators took uh, the Iranian consulate by force and hoisted a Iraqi flag. Is that a cover up or their actual origins? It's, it's hybrid warfare. All right, so remember, there, when the protests first came out in Iraq, it had to do with them, it's a, it's a complete shit show coming down the road because they know the oil prices. <laughs> the second protest, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, the second protests that are, that are going on lately have to do with these fake protests coming from people within Iraq that are backed by Iran trying to say we need to get the American troops coming out of Syria back in the, into Iraq. That's part of hybrid warfare. That's Russia versus the United States proxy. All right. And so um, that's the origins for that protest. And so the Iraqis, look, the Iraqis know what's going on. You know, there, there's people that are in Iraq that some of them are for Iran, but they don't want Iran to come in and take over. Remember, look at Canada. Canada and the United States were both Protestant countries. We don't want the Canadians coming down here and taking over us. We've got the same style of churches. We all drive the same cars. Yada, yada. We all watch baseball. Granted, they got better hockey players than us. But, you know, we don't want them coming down here and, and pushing their feminine livelihood. I mean, you know, who would want that? shouldn't assume, right? But anyways, that's what's going on in Iraq. That's what the last push is all about. Hybrid warfare. So here's an article that someone sent me. It says, watch. Here's how China's alternative economic system could collapse the U.S. economy. And this is from The Blaze. And I don't think it's from Glenn Beck. I think it's for one of his hosts. So I have to check, make double sure. But there's something I want to throw out there for you guys because, because people are challenging 
you know, I, I threw out a a copy of Trump's tweet. Said, hey, look, you know, we need to lower the value of our currency. We're getting our butts kicked here. We could have the Quan. We can have it all. We just need to lower the value of our currency a little bit. And I understand the other side's argument. It's like, well, we're not a... The U.S. dollar is not a domestic currency under traditional definitions. We're an international currency, so we can't hurt other people. We've got to figure out how do we have an advantage in the United States and also keep people addicted to the U.S. dollar. So both sides are right, believe it or not. So I don't see any, you know, it's not cynical as people think. It's the same thing with us competing with China or with Russia. You guys, it's not cynical. They're trying to expand their markets. What are we doing? We're expanding our markets. They are not my enemy like that. They are not the monster under the bed like these propagandists. I keep telling people, do not be provoked. If you're a professional, a true, loving, professional human being, you will not be provoked. Because it's all a bunch of worms that throw out that type of garbage. They're expanding their markets. There's different systems they use that they do that. And granted, some are better than the others for you and me. But nothing's different. But here's the thing. Let me read this real quick. Economic War Room joined Glenn Beck on the radio show to explain why China and Russia involvement in the U.S. economy is becoming more and more concerning. Not only are nations like China investing millions of dollars into American companies, but now they're banding together to create an alternative economic system from the one used in the West. So if China wants to pull the plug on our financial system, they could without destroying their own economy. Which is true. That's exactly what they, they plan on doing or they want to do or they fantasize about doing. All right. But here's the thing, you guys. What do you think the USSR was about? The USSR was the same proposal as the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. We're going to have 46, 40, almost exact same numbers. We're going to have 46% of the world's economy. We'll separate ourselves from the West. We'll go after the imperialistic dollar. And this is all before 1944, before all the conspiracies started going after the US dollar. That's from the USSR. They don't want to share anything. They want to control it all. The universe will be Russian. And that's exactly what they said. And so this is nothing new. So let me read this again. Not only are nations like China investing millions of dollars into American companies, but now they are banding together to create an alternative economic system for one that used or one that used in the West. So if China wants to pull the plug on our financial system, they could without destroying our own. So what is the economic financial system that we use in the West? It's a SWIFT system. And so China and Russia want to create their own. Well, they already have. It's called the BRICS. What do you think the BRICS is about? This is what makes me angry. They've already created that. And these guys are reporting, hey, guess what the Russians and the Chinese came up with? And what they wanted, they've already been doing that. That's the whole definition behind the BRICS. Is that, we, you guys, we just have cheese dicks in our educational systems and our media. They don't know. People, you know, I, I go through these these courses and stuff like that, and I show people this stuff, and they're like, why are they keeping it from us? They don't keep it from us. I used to think that myself. You sit down, you have lunch with them, you talk to them, they don't know. <laughs> so the Chinese aren't creating and have a good idea. They've been doing it since they created the BRICS. We have the IMF. They have the New Development Bank. We have the IMF, they have the AIIG, which is like the IMF, but it only invests into uh, companies in Southeast Asia or countries. So they have two versions of the IMF. Actually, if you really want to get down to it, they actually have three versions. The BRICS have three versions of the IMF. Where have these guys been? A little late. So we're talking on this program about the 50 trillion that China has just printed. Printing money doesn't mean anything. You guys want to, you know, the Germans did that. World War II, World War I. You had the winning side going to Germany saying, you guys owe us, I forget the X amount. Germany's like, hey, we'll be right back. 
went printed a shitload of Deutschmarks. And so everybody's like, huh, so that's how that works. Well, it drove the price of the Deutschmarks down. And when those German officials went back to Germany, they're like, what happened to our currency? And they're like, oh, the Jews did it. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. But they, uh, you know, so printing currency that China has printed and 24 trillion, all that looks like it went to offshore accounts. You guys, they printed currency to devalue their own currency. So this is wrong. I don't give a shit where it came from or who wrote it. It's very simple. We put tariffs on them. And then they printed currency to devalue the currency to make up for those tariffs. So of the, looks like it went offshore accounts and was invested in stocks, bonds, etc. Here in the United States, actually, it's, that's incorrect. Before China always devalues own currency, they use the higher price that they have at the moment to buy bonds and stocks. Then they devalue their currency and lower the value of their own currency. Or, or I should say print currency and devalue their own currency. So they got, they got the, the steps messed up. Um, here in the United States and the West, I mean, this is a staggering amount of money. If somebody wants to collapse the market, 20 trillion, 15 trillion, make the markets more dramatically, does it not? Appreciate all you do. Keep us educated. Look, here's the thing that you guys in 2009 so you had the russians 1997 let me go back a little bit 1991 the ussr fell all right they didn't know what to do then they decided hey look look how the west beat us they beat us economically they just kicked our asses so in 1997 they created their policy how they're going to add a containment and how they're going to bring back the russian empire it completely collapsed. So the USSR fell in 1991. Russia financially defaulted in 1997. They went to the Rothschilds and got loans. They were able to pay all that back because they caused the price of oil to go up. Hello, 9-11. Where do you think they got all that money to pay all that, you know, figure that out. Follow the money, right? The propagandists, follow the money. Okay, let's follow the freaking money. <laughs> So they got that. Next thing you know, they proposed the BRICS. And what's the BRICS? It's the USSR version two without the communist bloc and all that stuff. And it's just simply to expand their markets. And so what were they going to use as the BRICS as a counter to the trilateral commission and the US dollar? They're going to use the Chinese yuan. Well, they failed. Who's going to invest in a currency that they devalue at every chance they get? Because that's the advantage that they have, all right? So these guys can't get this stuff right if their lives dependent on it. They're so off. They're so off that it's unbelievable. And this is mainstream media, all right? They don't know what they're talking about. I don't even know. How, how do they get away with it? They get away with it because nobody knows. Let me see. Um... So let me, let me look at this. Sid, I'm reading this right in the middle of this, you guys, so I apologize. It, Freeman answered, you normally wouldn't be concerned about a major nation would realize that the blowback, if you destroyed the global financial system, would be so severe. The frightening thing to me is that China has, along with Russia and other nations, created virtually an alternative economic system that doesn't use the Western system at all. And so normally you could say, no sane nation that's not collapsing would collapse the world economy because it would just damage them too much. But we're fast approaching the point where they may have an alternative system. If they wanted to pull the plug on the West, they could restart very quickly. Really? So... Russia and China are going to get out of the West system. Who's the consumers of the world? It's the United States. Who's the second consuming market of the world? Largest consuming market of the world. It's Western Europe. You would say China. No, it's not. Even with all those people, if you look at 
exactly what it is those people have. They have nothing. So the volume of how many people they have, and let's say they all bag, buy one bag of rice a day, and that would probably blow what away what all of the Americans and all the Europeans you know, combined. But what are they doing? They're buying one bag of rice a day, and that's it. We're buying cars, we're buying microwaves, we're, so they're full of crap, all right? The thing about it is they're a day late, dollar short. This system to counter to the United States, there's two systems. One was USSR, it failed. The second version is the BRICS. It was designed and built to attack the Trilateral Commission, which is the United States, Japan, and, and um, the European Union. Now, within the, the Trilateral Commission, you and I still have a competition because you have internationalists versus nationalists. And people don't know that mix. So you have people that are running around in the Republican Party pretending they're nationalists, pretending they're for the United States. At the same time, they're swinging for the fences for international entities. And that's exactly how the middle class lost 5 million jobs, ladies and gentlemen. WTO got rid of our GATT got rid of our tariffs, and so we brought it back. And so we corrected that. And these cheese dicks are going nuts, and I love it. But you know what? In the end, they'll probably win because they're, <laughs> you know, they're smarter. They're just, it's just the way, it's the way the world works. It always has. So let me throw this up here. So here's a great article, right? And this is from OPEC. Um, OPEC members lack sufficient financial buffers to withstand another price collapse unscathed. Very, very good article because this is what we've been looking for for the last six, seven months. OPEC and its partners will not deepen their oil production cut yet, but all, but will discuss the topic again in December. This is what Saudi Arabia, newly appointed energy minister, um, told media after the week meeting, after this week's meeting of the Joint Ministerial uh, Monitoring Committee, a discussion, however, may not be enough. OPEC Plus, which is OPEC Russia, may be forced to decide to cut deeper to prevent a major slump in prices. So that's coming December, you guys. So, I mean, they're showing you the roadmap. So let's see what happens in December. When OPEC Plus agreed to cut 1.2 billion a million barrels from the global market in December last year, the benchmark price uh, reached without much enthusiasm. In hindsight, this was a harbinger of tough times. Although prices rallied in the beginning of the second quarter of the year, with Brent topping at 70 a barrel, the rally was brief and corrected. And that's when Trump opened up the oil reserves. And then what was the second time that he had to open up the oil reserves this last year? the attacks on Saudi Arabia with the drones. So the oil prices went up, what, 70, 71, 72 dollars per barrel? And then Trump's like, watch this. He opens up the reserves. It took like five days to get the oil prices down. <laughs> so you guys, that gap is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's very interesting the, what these guys are reporting and they can only cut back so much to where they're not making anything. All right, they're in a, you guys, people do not realize because it's not talked about in the news correctly. It's just not. I, you know, I'll be honest with you. I, I kind of told myself I would never talk about this, but there's, there's people that are in the media that I have a chance to talk to. And it's weird. It's, it's very, very weird because we'll talk about this stuff. And you guys, it's not like an interview. This is just conversations between friends. And they change the subject or they start doing this junior high comedy hour thing. You know why? Because they don't know. So they're trying to, I, I don't get it. I don't get the psychology behind it. You know, they just start, oh, well, you know, hey, if that happens or what, you know. And then they go out and talk about absolute nonsense like this garbage that's coming out that Russia and China uh, are putting the, you guys need to watch because they're putting a plan together and they're going to pull the plug on the West. Well, I got news for you. Russia doesn't have anything to pull the plug from. And China, let's, let's say, let me throw this out there. All right. The, the major consuming markets of the world, 
that buys everything, the Quan. It's the United States and Western Europe, the EU. And I realize some of those countries aren't, all of those countries aren't Western Europe, but it's the United States and the EU. China wants to be a consuming market. But again, China has a problem. Their people don't make enough money. You got the people on the East Coast. They're all filthy rich. They're very, very smart, very, very educated. But you have inner China where they're just, they're back in the Stone Age. Great people, by the way. The best. Fantastic people. It's not their fault. But you can't just print money. And you can't just one day they're consuming market. What China plans on doing is they plan on using cheaper labor to make products to sell to the, the, um, that market in China. So they're trying to turn that backward civilization, I, well, I shouldn't say civilization, that's not fair, that you know, the backward economic situation that's in most of China and try to turn them into a consuming market like Western Europe, like the United States. And we're stopping that. That's one of our counters to that. So China doesn't have that. Not only that, but if you look at China and how much their influence their currency has on the world markets, it's at, at its highest 2%. The United States is 70, 75%. So how are they gonna pull the plug on the United States? So China and Russia are gonna get together and pull the plug, huh? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's hysterical. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Sounds like, sounds like a plug-in just before they start selling gold, doesn't it? Oh my God, the U.S. dollar, it's gone. Look what the, the Chinese and the Russians are going to shut the U.S. dollars off. You guys, you sons of bitches, if China and Russia could shut the U.S. dollar off, they would have done it. They're not about to do it. You're not going to take a country with a currency that's 1.5 cents to the U.S. dollar and their major export is energy and energy is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and somehow they have an advantage over the United States and its consuming market. Oh, but they have China. China doesn't have a consuming market like the West does. So when you look at what China needs to survive, it's massive because it has a massive population. But that doesn't mean they're, being, they're, they're prosperous or their markets are expanding like they're out in the West. And that's the fundamentals that people don't know. So, you know, these guys who put that report out, nice try. Um, I'm sure you're geniuses, but that's not how it works. So anyways, look you guys, let me see if I have some more here. So what I wanted to be able to specifically point out for you guys in this audio was because of that question this gentleman asked. Um, let me see if I can find this again. So let's do a small review here, okay? It says, Tony, I know you have been in this investment for a long time. Are you surprised that it's taking so long for the revaluation? No, because I've been watching a rock's market and the market has been expanding. Now it's not. That's a big, big positive for you and me. And then what are we coming up in December? What's this article that I, that I just read talk about? So let me see if I can find this. Um, OPEC and its partners will not deepen their oil production cut yet but we'll discuss the topic again in December. This is what Saudi Arabia's newly appointed energy minister um, told media after this week's meeting with the Joint Monitor or, or Ministerial Monitoring Committee. A discussion, however, may not be enough. OPEC Plus may be forced to decide to cut deeper to prevent a major slump in prices. They actually are adjusting that right now, but there's going to be a major decision coming in December. And that will have a long-term effect on, here's what's going to happen, all right? They're going to cut production. It's going to cause the price of oil to go up. And they're going to find out how quick it is that we're going to respond. 
And what's Trump going to do? I can, you can, we can predict the future. He's going to open up the oil reserve, just like he did at the beginning of, of 2019, just like he did when the drone attacks on Saudi Arabia. And he's going to do it in December. Maybe he'll do it in January, depending on um, exactly when they pull the, the OPEC Plus pulls the trigger. Instead of four days, it might take two days to get the oil prices back. But you guys get the trend. Very, very, very good for us, you guys. And so that's it. Um, you know, it's, 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 remember, it's always about expanding markets. You measure a country if they're doing good or bad. China's getting their asses kicked. Their markets are shrinking. Russia's markets are shrinking. Their currency is representing that. The oil price, everything, it's all shrinking. All right, so that two perspectives. Are we going to go to war and sacrifice all what we have for a country that its markets are shrinking anyways? You know, one of the days we might have to. There's no way we can avoid it. But we're not there yet, are we? So why push it? So that's our thinking. That's our policy. Same thing with the United States. Our markets are expanding. Again, I can go through every country where their energy markets were turned off and we're taking up their customers. These deals that we're doing with, with Mexico and Canada are the biggest deals in the history of all mankind as far as trade goes. massive so our markets are expanding we have you guys people are running around everybody doesn't matter if it's a Democrat or whatever everybody notices the economy is doing good do you realize that we aren't able to do everything that we want to do to expand our markets we've been held back domestically can you imagine so there's a lot of room for us to grow and there's also a lot of room for us to take more advantage of these shrinking markets. But what you're going to see is you're going to see, it's like, look, you know, we don't need to destroy China. We don't need to destroy Russia. Let's maintain, but why don't you guys be part of our markets? We'll expand our markets. You can expand your markets and let's see what happens. Will that happen 100%? I don't know, but that's what our goal is. That's what our goal is. So, you know, and, and, if you look at the EU, look at the EU right now. Their markets are shrinking. You know, they were supposed to get out of, the, the Great Britain was supposed to get out of the EU the 31st of October, and they did not. It's not, you guys, they, they're not going to be able to avoid it. They're going to get out, all right? <laughs> and when I mean avoid it, I mean the EU is not going to be able to avoid the British getting out of the markets because what it is is you have the Brexit you have what uh, the British can make from the EU, and you have what the British can make from the United States. So with the, the, the current situation that they're in now, the British can only really do big deals with the EU. They get out of the EU, they can do business with both. That's what people don't realize. It's like, it's not like they're, you know, so people aren't going to buy Range Rovers in Europe and... People in or, or in, in um, outside of Great Britain in Europe, and then in Great Britain, nobody's going to buy BMWs. That that's not going to happen. You know damn well that. I mean, it's stupid to even think like that. What the British want is they want a massive trade deal with the United States, and they want a trade deal with the EU, without having the Germans tell them what to do all the time because the Germans control all that. German expansion, World War One, World War Two. And this is the latest version of it. The Germans control that. It just looks so different from what happened before. So what are the Germans doing? They're expanding their market. Who's the leader of the EU? It's the Germans. Who has the biggest economy in the EU? It's the Germans. And again, what are they doing? Expanding their markets. Nothing more than that. So the British are like, hey, um, we fought two wars against this. Fair, because we're all trying to expand our markets, but yeah, we're done. We get it. The mask is off. The mask is off. The Germans won. People don't realize this. The reality of the EU is a German victory. Think about that. It's all numbers. We're not interested in opinions. They have the biggest economy. They have the biggest and best of everything. They won. <laughs> 
They won. So who would have, who would have thought, right? But anyways, you guys, look, I ran out of time. And um, one more one more thing. Look, there, there, actually, there's a couple things I want to talk to you about. So let me set this. First of all, you guys, there's really nothing else that you need to look into or worry about. What you need to do is you need to make sure you understand what your exit strategy is once you exchange your currency. In other words, what your tax is going to look like. That's what you need to worry about. That's all you need to be thinking about. You don't need to be thinking how you're going to spend it. Because first you have to figure out how much you get to keep, right? And so you have to be thinking on that terms. The other thing is, um, my people have been asking me because I put out the offer to you guys only, the introduction to geopolitics and the free uh, webinars that I give for the people that, it's only you guys, all right? So that was supposed to end at the um, October, the end of October here, the beginning of November, actually, it was November 1st. Because I've been gone for two weeks, I'm going to extend that. So what it is, is you get the course, it's 13 lessons, seven and a half hours long, and then coming up, I'm gonna start the webinars. But here's how I put it together, all right? I'm going to wait and have an exact closing date on who can sign up and, and get the free webinars because you guys, I can't handle that many people. It, it would, I mean, and when I put the webinars, I'm gonna have to break it down to groups of 20, 50 people. You know what I mean? So that's how I plan on doing it. But I mean, I didn't communicate with anybody for the last two weeks. And so I apologize. So I'm going to extend that. But if you look at the link below on my YouTube channel here, and you guys, hey, if you guys, you know, I have two things. You can subscribe to my email or you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. And um, so whenever it comes up, you get that notice and boom, you're done. But go ahead and subscribe. But if you look at the link, the link is for more information on the geopolitical course. Now, the reason you guys are getting the information that you're getting is because these people who are asking these questions got this course. And so they have a, a geopolitical understanding. And here's what I want to throw out there. This is something that you can take with you for the rest of your life, ladies and gentlemen. It's not about, you don't need to know everything, all right? You just need to understand everything. You need to write that down and think about it because a lot of people it's like, well, you can't understand everything unless you know everything. That's not true. If I understand that we are in containment and we're trying to keep the Russians and the I can predict what's coming down the road. I can tell you where the wars are going to be at. It's going to be Central Asia. I can tell you we were going to be in Afghanistan because that is the center of the chessboard. That stops China from going west, the, um, the Russians from going south. India from going north. I mean, we are in the center of the chessboard. We control it all. This is because, why? Because we understand why we're there. Why? Because we understand what everybody's trying to do. So you don't need to know everything. You just need to understand everything. And that's what I offer in my courses, is how does this stuff work? How is it mechanically structured? How is it mechanically structured? It's a beautiful thing. The response is great. But to complete your course... Uh, well, to complete the introduction to geopolitics is the webinars that are coming up. And the only people I'm saying an invite to are the people that order the course. And um, so anyways, the people that order the course and absolutely love it and been giving me feedback, God bless you. Thank you so much. It is, you guys, it's such a cool thing. The, and these lessons are, um, the webinars are coming up. So give these people who are, are going to jump in here just a little bit of time. We'll jump right into that. And I'll start dividing up different groups. And um, But look at the link below because you'll see the link for the description more and introduction to geopolitics. You guys will never find anything like this anywhere else on the web. All right? Or anywhere. You just simply won't. You simply won't. It is, it is my best, you guys. It is fantastic. I love it. Um, this is what I do for a living. This is what I teach these, you know, uh, professors and these uh, corporations. I've been doing it since 1994. 1994. But anyways, everybody, thank you so much for your patience. I apologize for the huge delay. It's good to be back. Can't wait to get your emails and your next questions and be able to put up the next audio. But get that course, ladies and gentlemen. So thanks, everybody, and God bless.